All right, welcome everybody. We've got our SEO panel here coming up. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Mickey Mellon. Um, we'll run through and do quick intros of each of us. Um, essentially, this will be an SEO panel of the three of us, but I'll kind of moderate and catch questions and stuff. So I'll have a few questions for them to get started, but we want this to largely be a Q&A about all things search engines for two of the brightest search engine minds we have here. Um, so quickly about me. Um, I'm with Green Mill and Media, as a lot of you know. I've um, been doing search engine-y things for a decade or so, trying to rank sites better, uh, going back a long way. Mostly build WordPress sites now, do some search engine stuff on the side. Um, yeah, and work with these two on quite a few projects. So uh, we'll start with Jenny. She wants to introduce herself and tell us a bit about her history. And you guys can be thinking of, of questions to start hitting them with here in a few minutes after we get through where they are and where they've been. Hi, I'm Jenny Munn. And I started working with WordPress about seven years ago when I started out as a website copywriter. So I'm a little different than Mickey and Tom because I came from a marketing and copy background and not necessarily technical, which is what I bring to SEO. So I came to the very first WordCamp and braved the ice storm in 2010. And obviously since then I've been, uh, I have a little bit of a stalkerish, obsessive tendency with WordCamp because this is my seventh time speaking on SEO at a WordCamp. So I'm a little obsessed. I love the community and you know how much empowerment that WordPress can bring to clients and certainly to my own business. Um, and so today I work with in-house marketers and I consult with them on how to improve their SEO on top of all of their other digital marketing efforts. So that's what I do. Uh, would you like me to talk about? Yeah, go, go back got... a little bit too. Yeah, I can, I'll yeah. pull up your old one. Okay, so this is my current website, but again, I started out seven years ago as a website copywriter, and very quickly, uh, I had learned that just because I created what I thought was an awesome DIY website that I put up with, I lived in the happiness bar for a couple years here at WordCamp trying to get that thing up, um, that it did not automatically drive traffic to itself, which was uh, what I totally thought would happen, so I had to learn how to do my own SEO. Uh, and then I started doing SEO copywriting for people, and that led me over to the years to doing SEO consulting for businesses. So um, that's how I learned, be, by ranking number one for Atlanta Copywriter, and then evolving from there. All right. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? <laughs> my name is Tom Wynn. My plan has worked. Okay, so what else do you guys want to talk about? So, my name is Tom Wynn. I, I run a website design uh, company in Atlanta, and uh, I started I started freelance website designing in 2002. And over the last few years, I went from being like unknown to the very top of search engines. Mickey asked me yesterday, "Is like, do you rank number one for anything?" Because I was, I mean, I'll, I'm in the top five for a lot of phrases, but I'm not number one for well for the ones I mentioned. Actually, maybe I am. But uh, this is what I rank for. I'm anywhere from number one to number five, depending on where you're at, what device you're searching from. Um, Atlanta web developer, Atlanta local SEO, Atlanta web designer, freelance web designer, web designer, web design. So these are all pretty strong keywords to rank for. And so I get, I get as much, I get more business than I can handle. People are on the waiting list to do business with me. Um, so um, I get to pick and choose my clients. Uh, these, these clients, they try to sell me on doing business with them. And that's all I got to say about myself. <laughs> all right, cool. All right, we'll start with this. SEO changes quite a bit. I like to say it doesn't change a lot. Really, Google just gets better at enforcing the rules. But things do change in their algorithms. Um, so what's the biggest misperception you still hear today that clients come to you talking about they want to do that you know is wrong or old or just wrong? Yeah. Either one of you. Mm. <laughs> what is wrong? I know they just want, they want to mention like they, they want to rank for Atlanta, but they're not locating Atlanta. They're located in Cartersville. And so I, I can't get them to rank above a company that's located um, in Atlanta, if they're located out there. That's, right, that's fine. There you go. 
Uh, so one of the things I hear, and I feel like, and I'm sorry guys, you can't see us really great over there. Um, I, I feel like this is not very popular, but one of the misperceptions that I feel is out there is just write good content. Obviously that's a huge part of SEO, but that is just one piece of SEO. There's just so much more that has to come together today. Writing great content is important, but it's not the only thing. The same thing with, uh, you know, PR is a new SEO or social media is the new SEO. That's accurate in the fact that those are big contributors, but alone there's no one individual thing that contributes to a super high ranking. So I think that would be it for me. Just content is so important, of course, but it's not SEO as a whole discipline by itself. Okay, I have some more to say now. Okay, so Jenny just talked about great content. That's one of the aspects. You've got to have backlinks as well, but content's really important. You've got to, if you're, like for instance, in my, uh, on my website, if I'm just selling website design, I'm not talking about any aspects of it, it's, it's not going to be a very, very valuable site. Google's in the business of providing the best, um, the best websites on the top. And by the best websites, uh, I mean informative websites. What are you informing people about website design? If you're just selling throughout the whole website, then it's not going to be a really good source. And then you've got to have the backlinks from, say, local directories, other other blog posters. Um, for instance, uh, I've I've got a good uh, backlink from Jenny. Uh, she gave me a, she gave me an interview not too long ago. Um, could you go to Jenny's website? Yeah. That interview. So this this interview that she gave me was back when I was on the bottom of page one, and uh, uh, I answered the questions. And there's a few backlinks in there. So I got this interview right here because I posted valuable content on my website, not just because I spam people and say, "Hey, get some website design for me." I don't sell anything on my social media. All I do is provide advice. That's all I got. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Cool, and then the other one Jenny and I were talking about last night we hear, and again, a lot of misperceptions out there, and I don't want to go too far into that, but things like clicking on your own rankings in the search results. People will say, I think Jenny was saying she saw a group of people that said they'd all get together and search for each other and click the results and they're trying to rank higher, and things just don't do work that way. Um, and we'll get into some more of those as we go along, but I have a few more questions for them, but I'd rather use those as filler if we need and hear what you guys want to learn and, and pepper them with that. So hands, hands if you have questions to, to get things going. Nobody yet? We have lots of juicy secrets. There we go, here in the back. You. There we go. Back to what Tom was talking about earlier. It's like, let's say you have a service company that services, like, let's say, five or six accounts, uh, uh, four sites, and then, and they want to break high in those now, and they have 10 or 15 trucks and they want to break high in those companies. Does Google now make a portion of the account that only do well for it and only do well for it off the disk? Or is there a way or a strategy where they can break in all those accounts? All right, let me repeat that just for anyone. So he's asking, yeah, if someone has business in multiple counties, they have a home office in one place and business in multiple counties, how, if any way, can they rank in those various counties without having a presence in them? So, Tom, thoughts? Okay, so... Oh, check, check. Okay, so there's two types of rankings in Google. And if, you've, if you do a search, uh, you've probably seen the map listings first, which shows... Uh, it shows map, address, phone number, website address. Maybe. No, it doesn't show the website address, but it has a link to the website. So those results are going to be geographically tailored. So they're going to give you the results that are closest to you uh, where you're searching. Um, so it's not going to show like, it's not going to show like a moving company 50 miles down the road over someone that's like one mile down the road. Now they're right below the geographic, uh, the local results are gonna be the organic results. And now those you, you have a little more influence on. And so you might be able to, you might be able to pop up for that whole region. If, if, you, if you do the right things, you have uh, the cities in your title tag and your tags and your links and H1, H2 tags. Mm. Uh, what was the other part of your question? Is, is that it? Well, just how do you do that? Yeah. So there you go. You, you've largely answered it. How would, how would you do it? Yeah. How would, how would you get to rank in those places? Yeah. So if you're in Atlanta, you want to rank in Dunwoody. Okay. Dunwoody. So, so if you have those locations, but you, I mean, to rank in the, 
to rank for the map locations, you gotta, you've got to have a physical address in every one of those locations to rank. And then you, sh you should specify like, um, like a service area. So like, I'm not sure if you've seen on the maps, it'll show like, it'll, it won't show, like there are some places that don't have an address, but it has like a, a range of area that just, that, that business serves. So that, that might be able to, that might allow your business to show up in the map listings. There, no, no, you can actually set up uh, city-specific pages. I've done it for a granite countertop company. Like, I set up, like, uh, granite countertops in Noonan, granite countertops in Columbus, granite countertops in LaGrange. But when you do those city-specific pages, you better be talking about the city. You got to talk about the city, and then you can talk about it. You got to find a way to talk about the city and how the service ties in. You can't just, you can't say, hey, or you want to rank for uh, like Grand Countertops in LaGrange, Georgia, and you don't talk about LaGrange at all. So what you can do is you can give like a history of the city, um, give, give a history of the city, and then somehow you've got to tie it in. If you have any history of the city, then throw that in there. Uh, both of them would be both of them would be good, but if you and if you link to them, it'd be even better. Uh, hopefully, that answered your question. Yes, All right. yeah, in general, pages and blogs, in theory, are the same. They're both just individual URLs for Google to rank. Um, in theory, though, I would say if you had a page devoted to that city and had blog posts around it, then like Tom said, have those blog posts linking back to that page and help build that one page up to be more more authoritative. Well, uh, one more remark. Like on my way up to the very top of page one on Google, Bing, Bing sucks. So by the way, uh, uh, <laughs> Duck, Duck, Go, Yahoo, uh, those suck too. But um, I'm on, I'm on the top of those too, but they they're still horrible. Um, I uh, I documented my trip up to the top, and I mentioned like Atlanta web design in every one of my blogs. But that, it made sense and it flowed. I, like. We, I had like week three of my quest to be top, the top for Atlanta web design. So that had Atlanta web design in the blog title. And then when I mentioned Atlanta web design in, in the content, I linked to my web design service page. So, so that, that told the search engines that, that whoa, that, maybe that's, uh, that page has something to do with Atlanta web design. And can I, I was just going to yeah, say something that, um, so it's really funny because we all disagree with each other on certain things, and I think that that's okay. So like, <laughs> we won't get too much into follow or no follow links now. But Tom talks about a local, a local or um, directory citations and backlinks, and I'm not necessarily a big fan of that. And so we just have each such good different backgrounds. It's something for you all to know too. He specializes in a lot of local SEO. I do a lot of national. Mickey does a lot of technical and a lot of reporting and a lot of looking, a lot of troubleshooting too when it comes to SEO issues. So it's good to know too, and we all have different backgrounds and disagree with each other slightly on different things, which kind of makes it fun, so. Cool, in the back, yeah. You have a client that has top rankings, they come to you and they say, look, I want my site to totally redesign. You notice you have to lose material and redirect, but how do you, you know, with that new site, how do you kind of ensure that you don't end up being pushed down because things <laughs> Good question. Yeah. So he asked you, yeah, if you have a client with a top ranking, you want to totally redo their site but not risk losing the ranking, how do you ensure that you don't? Um, the first is you can't ensure that you don't. <laughs> but there's certainly things you can do to give yourself the best chance possible. We, yeah, we've had that a few times. We had one that came to us that was stuck at number three and said, three is good. I don't want to lose that. And I said, we can probably get you to two. I promise nothing. And sure enough, making the site mobile responsive and doing things that she needed got her to number two. But um, yeah, it's really just, I think first, yeah, you said 301 redirects, I think make sure the keywords, use the same kind of keywords and the same title tags and stuff as you have before. Keep the page URLs the same if possible or put in redirects to other pages that go around. Um, further thoughts on things they could do? Yeah, so when you do a redesign, preserving the SEO you have is really important. So Google Analytics and Google Search Console, which is formerly Google Webmaster Tools, are going to be your best friends into understanding, okay, well, what is the specific keyword or keywords that are ranking? What is the website page, the URL it's going to? Because it's not always going to be the home page. Then really taking all those top SEO pages and understanding, okay, well, where is a keyword used? 
is, um, you know, I still say above the fold, is there a copy up there? Do you have an H1? How many words are on the page? So really preserving all of that and then one-upping it, of course, with a mobile responsive redesign. But you really do have to make sure you preserve and carry across any SEO. And if you are redirecting URLs, you really have to be very careful. There's sometimes when the URL stays the same and it's just a facelift. But if you are redirecting, you have to be very careful about that and know that you might not preserve all of the SEO value, but you will work your way back up. Cool. Thank you. Do you have, yeah. Yeah, you. Yeah. All right, so yes, yeah, she asked, yeah, for the sake of the video. Uh, if you have a business online that doesn't have a local address at all, but you want to target some local customers, is that accurate? And how do you do that? Local, national, regional, international. <laughs> so your target is everybody, which is not a great target, but yeah. Tom, thoughts? So you're not going to put, uh, you're not going to put an address? Oh, there we go. Check, check, check. You're right. You're not going to put an address? You don't want to put an address on there, but you want to rank for national? Okay, um, it's going to be, I mean, you're not going to rank in the, the map list things ever without an address. Uh, you might be able to hit the organic uh, results below it, and that's, that's okay. You don't have to have it for there, but you better, you better have a really informative website uh, that talks about the industry, and more so than just selling, like putting like buy widgets, uh, by now, like all over your website, isn't going to make make it rank any higher. So if you got you've got to provide information about it. That's that's the only way I can think of about ranking nationally. I I took um, I took a gravel driveway company and like within a year from like being unknown to like the very top for gravel driveway repair. But they had they had an address, but I got them to rank nationally. I, I would just say one of the biggest tips, of course, um, if you're starting out, can you give us an idea of your keywords that you want to rank for? Do you know the keywords? Uh, okay. So, um, and that's okay. A lot. Ladies Apparel. Okay. 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 So that's definitely one of the first steps. Um, Ladies Apparel is really general and very competitive. So the more general terms, the more competitive it's going to be. So it's really counterintuitive, but the way to start ranking um, immediately, it's not counterintuitive in that you want to go after more long tail terms, be more specific at first. Once you start ranking on some of those more longer tail terms, then that helps build momentum up to the more competitive terms. So that's just certainly get, get very specific if you can, you really are going to have to because you can't start ranking high for those competitive terms. So you've got to go more specific. And if you can identify a target market, um, that's even better because Google will tailor. Like they know the context of your site and your products, and they will tailor it to the appropriate search. So you're just going to have to get very specific. Cool. Yes, yeah, so three of you over there. One of you. <laughs> All right, so there's two questions, yeah. One is asking about paid search and just our general opinions on paid search, and then making yeah, PDFs available, making them searchable and findable from Google there. So. Yeah, so I love paid search. So I only do organic SEO, but I love when people do paid search um, because it shows that they are willing to commit and invest in getting in front of their target market in more than one ways. So I think when people are involved in paid search, it just shows that they're not you know, they won't put all their eggs in organic SEO. They're trying to do multiple things and they're putting a budget where they need to be. So I, I like paid. Some people come to me and say, well, should I do paid or organic? And it depends on how quickly do you need to get up onto Google. Organic SEO is a lot longer term investment, so you're not going to see results right away. So the diversification is really important. Um, I like that. And then as far as, yeah, my free report, uh, I do have a landing page. If someone Googled around SEO essentials or some of the keywords, they'll land on my landing page. Um, that mostly is so that I can get people to opt in and take advantage of website traffic I get. And that's one of the biggest things too, is that a couple years ago, people would Google 
you know, Atlanta copywriter, SEO consultant, and almost immediately they would reach out and become a lead. But these days, the sales cycle is just longer and more complex, and people are self-educating a lot. So the quicker I can get them onto my list, then the, the better I can nurture them. So I do have a couple free opt-in uh, reports to get them on my list, even if they're not going to convert right away, they're visiting my site. So that's what that's for. It's crawlable, but uh, on the home page, it's mostly for opt-ins. Yeah, the PDF itself is not crawlable because it's hidden away and they only get it when they download. Yeah, right behind him there, yeah. All right, so he's asking just, yeah, ethical backlinks. How to gain ethical backlinks. Did you get emails all day long saying, hey, we need you 10,000 backlinks for $9. And if you get that, put your competitor's name in it and you'll, yeah, you'll do better. But I don't do that either. Uh, but yeah, what is, yeah, backlinks are something we used to offer that to help you get your backlinks. And now we, for us, we just do more consulting out saying, hey, if you're a member of the Chamber of Commerce, do that. If you're speaking at WordCamp, get your, you know, try to get, because it's so hard to build. But Tom is, is Mr. Backlink, so let's hear what he has to say. Okay, so there's several types of backlinks you can get. You can go to directories, but you've got to be very careful about those. If you go to any directory that lets you put anything in the title of it, if, like for instance, if I'm, I get to put best Atlanta website designer in Atlanta, Georgia, you, you probably want to avoid that. So you want to find directories that, that, uh, that only let you put unbiased uh, text about your uh, website. Like for instance, like DMOZ is a, is a huge directory. You can't pay to get in there. I mean, you, it's not a paid directory, it's free, but you've got to know somebody or it's like a secret society to get into it. Uh, and how I know it's, if it's uh, pretty powerful is that sometimes Google pulls the descriptions from DMOZ and, he, and it puts into the meta descriptions for Google or it puts into the description text. Then there's local directories, those are credible like uh, Yelp, um, City Search, Super Pages, um, Chamber of Commerce. There's several of those. There's like 60 something directories. And you could go through like, a, like a, you, you could use a tool like Yext, which allows you to do it all at once. Um, but the only, the only drawback of that is, is that if you cancel their service, like if you didn't create the pages yourself and you didn't, uh, um, you didn't, create the listings yourself, as soon as you cancel with Yext, they'll, they'll remove it or your page goes a blank in there. So that's, that's another type of credible backlink. Another one is, um, you know, if you're providing information, someone, someone's bound to like uh, link to you after a while if you, if you provide it uh, useful information. Like Jenny linked to me, um, is Judy Knight in here? Judy? No. Judy, no, no. Anyway, so Judy Knight wrote a blog post on me too, you know, on my contact form. Um, you could also get uh, customer spotlight stories, like let's say if you have a vendor, like can you go to my Elegant Themes page? Yeah, I don't know which one it is here, we'll find it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's the one for Judy. Okay. There we go. Uh, all right, so Elegant Themes is a vendor of, uh, they're, they're a WordPress premium uh, theme provider. And so I converted my website to, um, to Divi, uh, like around this period right here, or right before it. And I asked him if I could submit a spotlight story, and uh, and allowed me to have some links in there. Granted, these links are no-follow links, <laughs> but, but you know, uh, follow or no-follow, my, um, my, vis my site business doubled after, after this article came out. <laughs> Um, so that's another type, and then so you got you got general directories, local directories, s customer spotlight stories. Uh, you can have you can talk talk enough to where other people blogging about you, and then uh, there you have social media. You have your social media pages, Twitter, Facebook pages, uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn has a company page, so find those Pinterest. All those are all credible. They're not spam. They're not spam links. I just wanted to give my opinion on that really quickly. So, um, credible backlinks. So, I like how did you guys hear Rich Brooks talk about local SEO? And Brooks is not his last name. Rich talked about local SEO, and he was really good and said that after blogging and putting up a lot of high quality content on your site for a while, links kind of do just come. But in the meanwhile, you should definitely go out more purposefully and, and ask identify sites 
in your, um, in your neighborhood of the, the community you want to be in, the people you want to be in front of, and asking is just so critical. What can I do? Can I post something here? Guest blog posts are still really relevant. But my biggest secret on when I'm helping uh, clients identify their links is first of all, go to their Google Search Console, and it's a free report. You can go and pull the latest links to that website. And so I look and see, well, where have they already gotten links? And I can help them identify, here's where you've already gotten links. Keep doing more of that or do more of this more purposefully. And then also Moz has a tool called Open Site Explorer. And I will plug in, uh, I will Google the keywords they want. I'll see who are the websites ranking at the top for those terms. And then I'll plug five, six, seven competitors into Open Site Explorer. And I'll pull all the backlinks to the companies at the top. And I can really start identifying, okay, well, they're a member of this association, they have this press, they must have a PR agency, um, they've sponsored this event. So when you start looking at the backlinks of your competitors, it's just, it finally starts to dawn on you what a backlink is and how can you get it more readily pertaining to your industry. So competitive spying is my answer for that. And just a little more backstory there for those of you not as versed in SEO. You know, when Google came out in the late 90s, you know, search engines were horrible back then, if you remember Northern Light and Lycos and all those. And Google decided if more people link to a site, it's probably a better site. And it, for the most part, works. Um, and while that was pretty much all they were in the late 90s, that's still a big factor today. And then Tom mentioned no follow and follow. And I know some of you may not know that. So I think it was in 2007, Google decided, okay, people leave spam comments a lot and stuff. We'll set up a thing where if people put links in certain places, they'll have a little no follow tag, which means Google ignore this link or at least counted a lot less. We can debate about how they treat those. Um, so getting a link that is followed, like from Jenny's blog or from Judy's blog is great. Getting a link that is no followed, like from Elegant Themes is not as good, but like Tom said, he still doubled his traffic from the pure click. So even if that link was of zero value, it's still good to have. But when you hear follow versus no follow, that's what that is. Most social media links are no followed, so they don't count directly to help you, but again, still can be some second and third party ways they make an effect. Yeah. All right, so getting rid of spammy backlinks, how you do it, and the impact it has on SEO. It's not a foolproof way, but there's a dis, uh, link disavow tool in uh, Google Webmaster Tools. Yeah, I would say yes, you should probably go and contact them because I have a, a message board from years ago that's still up that has a lot of spammy accounts and stuff on it that shady people added. And so when they come to me and say, hey, will you please remove my link, I make them grovel a bit because they're the ones that were you know, spamming my site for their own benefit and then they got hosed by it. So I don't have a whole lot of love for that, but I can appreciate there are a lot of cases where you step in to help someone and they already have this history. Uh, but you should still try to reach out. Even Google says the best way is to just get those links taken down. But then, yeah, then add what you can to disavow and, and hope for the best is kind of what I've seen, what I've experienced. But I don't know if you have further. I just insight. wanted to make a comment yeah. on that. So I think that every site or most sites I see have some spammy backlinks pointing to them because you can't control that. And Google knows that for the most part that you can't always control who's going to link to you. It is certainly a problem, though, if um, the bad backlinks, the spammy backlinks, substantially outweigh the good backlinks. And what I've seen, so I have a client now, and they've got a lot of spammy links with like Louis Vuitton fake purses pointing back to their website. Um, Viagra and Casino are definitely a huge problem, so the flag those right there, you definitely need to take care of them. But if I'm starting to see their keywords come in, like I've got a client and there's a lot of pharmaceutical drugs, they have nothing to do with pharmaceutical drugs, and it's coming in as impressions in their analytics and search console, that's when it's a problem. Or if you're not ranking because of that. So again, a handful of spammy links are okay if you've got the majority of good links. Google does want to see a history that you've tried to reach out to the owner. So again, even if you know it's not going to work, I was on a lot of backlink removal teams a couple years ago, and they just want to see record that you tried. Again, a lot of spammy sites, they don't have a webmaster, there's nobody to email, but at least if you have a record that you tried, then definitely go the disavow method. 
Yeah, and disavow, for those that don't know, in Google Search Console, which is a free thing you can all connect to your site, it used to be called Google Webmaster Tools. Yeah, they have a, a feature in there where you can add a text list of links that you don't want to count and just upload that to them, and Google should disavow them and not count them against you anymore. Uh, free tool, but they warn you be very, very careful because if you put some good links in there, they will, those won't count anymore either, and you could tank your rankings real fast, so be super careful. Um, way in the back. Gotcha. So the first one was meta description versus meta keywords? Yeah. Okay. Um, as well as meta gotcha. So just meta descriptions versus meta keywords and you, including misspellings in them. Right. Um, meta keywords you can completely ignore. Google has never used that as a signal since day one. That was why Lycos and all those were so bad because you could just fill that with a bunch of stuff and you'd rank high and it was, you know, worked well for spammers. Meta description is valuable in a secondary way. It doesn't help you rank any better. Google said we don't look at the keywords in there at all. However, that's typically the snippet that shows up under your search result. So if you have a nice well-written description saying, hey, this page will answer your question, whatever it is, and the other one's just kind of the list of navigation, whatever the generic stuff is, you might be ranked third or fourth and get the clicks because yours looks more compelling. Neither one will affect rankings. Uh, for misspellings, I haven't done a lot with that lately. Google's getting so good about correcting misspellings in the results anyhow, I don't really concern myself with that, but either you have other thoughts on misspellings and including them intentionally in places? Yeah, and you know, that's kind of an older practice where you would go and add misspellings, but you know, this is one of those things where, uh, and, and I'm not saying this, like, but common sense trumps the SEO factor. So if there's like a one of, that's more of a commonplace way to spell the term, for brand consistency, you just want to be consistent and you don't want to misspell on your website. So you just kind of have to pick one and forego, but that did used to be an older school tactic. And of note there, yeah, related to that, having, again, having keywords in your meta description or meta keywords doesn't help at all. So the only place you could put the misspellings is in your title tags and in your headers, and yeah, that would look pretty bad. So I would typically avoid that. I agree um, with Mickey on the meta description. That it, has, it doesn't have, like, a direct effect on your ranking, but it does have an effect on your click-through rate. So if it, if it looks enticing uh, and someone clicks on it, and they stay on your website too. That's also an important factor. If they click on, let's say if you're at the top and Google clicks on your, your listing and they uh, immediately hit the back button, maybe it's telling Google that your content sucks. Um, there you go, cool. Right here. How often does SEO criteria change? Now, how often does SEO criteria change, all right? Where to go to find out? Cool. So again, my general philosophy is that it hasn't changed much at all in 17 years. I think really the only change Google has made is to make mobile sites more rank higher because obviously in 98 they didn't, and maybe a bit with secure sites. Everything else Google has done is just is forcing their laws better. You know, 98, 99 they said don't spam keywords in there, don't spam backlinks, all that. It worked, and so all they've done, all their changes really, are just fixing all the stuff they've been telling you not to do that finally are kicking in. You know, there's a big penguin update or a big panda update and everyone panics that sites are losing ground. It's typically sites that were cheating and succeeding and then they lost ground and the rest of us that were legit all moved up two spots. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. I know we may disagree a little bit here, so thoughts? No, I think the principles okay. are pretty much the same. And, but where do you go to keep up with stuff? How about that? That part Moz, of it. Uh, yeah, Moz.com is great. They have every Friday they have a, a whiteboard Friday video that Rand does that picks a topic and spends 10 minutes just as a cutesy whiteboard thing explaining a, a topic or theory and stuff. That's pretty good. What's that called? Again? M-O-Z. M-O-Z.com. They used to be SEO Moz. Now they're just Moz. But they have great, great stuff. Great tools. Jenny mentioned Open Site Explorer. That's theirs. They have some paid tools, but lots of free, great blogs and videos and other, other sources. Yeah. Maybe SEO Land. SEO Land, yeah. And then I would, so um, those tend to be, uh, I think, websites that people who are like really nerdy like us go to. Like, you know, SEO professionals, if you're like a business owner or maybe a marketer, um, I think HubSpot and Social Media Examiner are a little bit more general. It may be easier to understand, but certainly any SEO industry site is really good. But if there's a big change, you'll hear about it in multiple places. So anywhere you follow digital marketing, but. I do like those two, HubSpot and Social Media Examiner. And then one thing about does SEO, you know, keeping up with changes. So what I kind of tend to think, like, you know, how often does Facebook change? Like Facebook evolves pretty often. 
And that's how I think of Google. Like Google is going to continue to evolve and change different things, but the core foundational layer of how you do SEO has not changed in a number of years. So as long as you have a solid understanding, and my mind was blown today, so is Nancy by chance in the room who spoke on accessibility and accessible websites? If, if anybody was in her session, she went through a checklist, it was a two column checklist on everything that has to do with an accessible website. And everything on there was SEO 101, on-page optimization 101. And so that kind of stuff, that's good common sense website marketing has not changed in a number of years. It's just when you try to do some of the spammier things that that's what Google constantly penalizes and tries to stay ahead of. So just learn your foundational SEO and then you just learn incremental changes on top of that. It's really not too bad. Cool. All right, over here. So a review on your site from Carol in Marietta, Georgia, wondering if that helps you rank better in Marietta. Um, my thought would be yes, a little bit, because you're getting Marietta in your page. I would say it would be infinitely better if she could go leave that review on your Google Plus page or on your Yelp page or something that Google looks at as a review, as a more authentic review rather than something you very well could have put in there yourself. Uh, but the keyword in there will help a smidge, I think, but we encourage people you know, we encourage our clients all the time, please, you know, leave a, we give them a simple email that says, hey, here's our Google Plus page, here's our Yelp page, just click whichever one you like more, you know, leave us a review. Most people are logged into one or the other most of the time anyhow. It takes 30 seconds, helps a whole lot more. Um, further thoughts on page? I just have a quick thing. So I think it, it probably would help, but what I caution is don't make people do that on purpose. So don't ask every user to sign in with the name of their town or put that, because when Google sees patterns of trying to scale something, that's when they might flag you. So again, every once in a while instance is fine, but let people choose that on their own if they did do that. I, I have, um, I mean, I don't make them put the city in their review, but on my website, sometimes I'll put their city below it. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, like on my web design page or SEO services page, I'll put I'll put their review, and then they'll say like their name, their title, their company, and where the company is located at. So it's in there, but it's not it's not looking spam like. Oh, good call. I would discourage it. I just, I, I don't buy any extra domain names to rank higher. Yeah, in short, yeah, Google, a few things. One, Google doesn't look at the text in domain names nearly as much as they used to. It's EMD updated a couple of the exact match domains. It still matters some, but they think it's silly to rank first for a keyword because it's in your domain name versus in your content and links and stuff. Having multiple domains pointed to your site, though, they don't count at all. If you do it properly as a 301 redirect where they redirect in, they count 0% toward that. But it still can be useful. You know, if I say go to greenmelonmedia.com, you guys are going to spell it four different ways probably. And so whichever way you spell it, though, it's going to redirect to the main one. Google doesn't see those misspellings, but it's good for our business to say it to have the redirects. Well, like you were saying, they have a lot of webdesign.com. So, if, yeah, I don't know what the company name is, but if you have a, a name for that, and then you have a lot of websites, webdesign.com, mm -hmm. you have two different URLs, right? No, they're, they're all one URL. They rank for all those keywords. Yeah, he's actually MrTechnique.com, but it's MrTechnique.com slash Atlanta Web Design. So you still get the key. And again, those keywords in there don't help as much as they used to, but it does. It looks good and can help a little bit. Just yeah. type in like Atlanta Web Design on Google and see if you can find me in like top five. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. yeah. Even better, type in Atlanta Local SEO too. So. <laughs> So if you have a craft website, how do you beat Pinterest and Etsy? So, all right, Jenny, how do we beat them? Yeah, so that's <laughs> tough. Um, while you, know, you do want to do all your SEO best practices, but while you're waiting on that, definitely developing a community, long tail blog posts, social media, maybe some paid. So it just absolutely will be an uphill battle because of who you're competing with. So you can do it, you know, again, the more you've, you can identify a target market and really be specific and really bring even more value and do a lot of outreach and try to do guest blog posts. Um, there's just going to be a lot of work to try to outseat them. So 
I have clients who they have their own website, but then they also are on Amazon Local, you know, the handmade, um, the Amazon handmade one, and they also have Etsy. So they've really tried to repurpose and be everywhere, which I think is the general theme, just be everywhere. So it's going to take a while for their website, but in the meanwhile, they could put videos on YouTube, and maybe YouTube will rank. I see LinkedIn Pulse articles rank for top keywords, so maybe the site won't rank on page one, but I'll see a LinkedIn article come up. So make sure that they're in all the most important places, so maybe they can rank other places while their website is gaining traction. It yeah, will be, be an uphill battle. Education is really important about that. And be on Pinterest. You know, that could be, if Pinterest's out ranking, if they have their stuff on Pinterest, maybe it'll rank number one. It'd be better to come straight to your site, but if they go there and it's another click, it beats, beats nothing. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Uh, okay, so can you all explain how so social media activity helps or doesn't have any impact? So I don't really know. How does it affect your ranking, your own activity, and then reposts? How does that affect your uh, So ask, She's asking about social media activity, how it affects your actual rankings with your own activity and with other people talking about you. So, Tom, you got thoughts? I mean, it affects it, but I, I mean, everything we're saying is all theory. We don't work for Google or Bing. Uh, you don't work for if, you, if you're putting, uh, <laughs> if you're putting backlinks in, in your social media posts, it probably gives it a little bit of weight, but they might be no follow. Or they, they are, yeah. All, yeah. Most of that's no follow. Yeah, but it brings traffic, and it brings traffic. That's what I was going to say, too. Social media is more indirect. Uh, but it really helps, of course, with discoverability. So when you promote and share your content and it gets in front of more people, there's more of a chance to get backlinks or to get visits to your site. And in Google Analytics, there's a very specific report that tells you how much of your traffic comes from social media and gives you a breakdown of which specific accounts it comes to. And so what I say is anything analytics can measure, they're either taking into account for or against your site. Like Tom mentioned, pogo sticking is if someone comes to your site and then bounces off really quickly. Or if they stay and they're consuming your content and they scroll down and they visit multiple pages, those are great signs. So the same with social media too. There's just a lot of correlation with sites that do, um, you know, they're active on social and they're actually getting visits from there and their content is getting in front of other people. That really does boost it. So it's not direct, it's indirect, but you definitely want to be doing that to be everywhere. Yeah, I believe Google has said directly that that stuff doesn't influence your rankings because they're all no followed. But again, yeah, if you can get get it spread around more than other people blog about you and stuff, then those blog links are followed, and it can it can be a good thing. Right. Yeah. Certainly can help your business out. Yeah. Oh. For me, I, I look at uh, trying to improve my search. How how the methods I do to improve my search engine rankings are. I don't really push business. I, I try to establish myself as. Um, an authority source, or I try to provide advice in there, and uh, Google loves that. If you, I don't know, let's say you type in a celebrity's name, what's the first thing results that's going to show up? Wikipedia. Wikipedia is nothing but information; they're not selling anything. How do you blog? I blog about once, once a month. It used to be once a week, but then I got so busy, it got to be once every two weeks, once every three, okay. now it's once every month. But I make sure I blog. I blog regularly, well, at least once a month. And since then, like, I, I went from like a static website to a WordPress site, and then since then, I used to, I started out with like 10 pages, and then I went up to now I'm like 150. So, uh, 97 blog posts, so I'm coming up on my 100th pretty soon. Gotcha, cool. Let's go back this side. I'm, oh, sorry, yeah, we'll go back to you. Yeah. Okay, good question. So a lot of a lot of you have things set up on your site. When you post a blog entry, it automatically posts to Facebook and Twitter and all those. And how do you avoid duplicate content penalties from that? Um, a few thoughts I have, and then we'll see what they have. One, I don't recommend doing that too often. Um, we'll do it occasionally for clients, but it's going to take. If you've written, spend an hour writing a blog post, spend ten seconds to post it on Facebook and Twitter. Make sure it looks good and looks, you know, formats correctly. And Facebook takes that into account in their algorithm for how many people they'll show it to. Uh, for duplicate content, it doesn't really apply too often because most of those will just show a snippet, whereas you have the full thing. You know, Twitter's only going to have a link to you, you know, a link that may or may not help, but it's not duplicate content. Um, and then finally, what I've discovered, and again, there's differing opinions, is there is no duplicate content penalty per se. They don't penalize you for duplicate content. They just figure out who the original source is. That one ranks well, and any duplicates don't. So if you've written it first, just make sure the one on your site is the one Google sees as the authority, and anything else is, is, comes off of that. 
Um, that's also the reason I don't worry too much about people that steal our content because I know as soon as you post a blog entry, there's probably five or ten sites if you do some searching that grab your RSS feed and, and repurpose it. And I don't worry about that too much because as long as Google knows that we were the authority, they'll do the rest, ding the rest of those instead. And if they ding us for one, it's not a penalty. It's just saying someone, this is the good copy of that. So further thoughts on social sharing, anything? All right, cool. All right, yeah. Cool, so good question. So she said they're number one for Atlanta graphic design, which is pretty awesome. They want to be number one for just graphic design and do their backlinks need to say just graphic design to help further that cause? Possibly, but you might actually rank for graphic design if inside the city of Atlanta if you're located in Atlanta. Like right now, I, I rank for web, website designer or web designer in Atlanta, but I don't rank, I'm sure I don't rank for that to anywhere else. You want to talk about? Um, Anchor text, Anchor text yeah. So, so you're meaning from other websites to link over to you with the term graphic designer. Uh, that did, when people did that at scale, they tried to influence the anchor text, the copy that was actually in the backlink back to them. Um, they did get in trouble for that. So you have to be careful. You could have uh, maybe one or two links try to say back because Google can directly tell that you are somehow influencing that backlink and they don't like that. So again, if someone were to kind of link to you naturally-ish with that, that would be good, but you want to make sure that you don't do that at scale, which is what I say. So one or two instances, but certainly link to your own, internally link to your own pages with descriptive text, and I can certainly see graphic designer being one of those. So the answer is you could do it, but be very careful to be a very minimal amount. That's okay, cool. We have just, yeah, we're about out of time. We'll do like one more. Yeah. Oh, well, it's not good. All right, so other than Google Analytics and Search Console, top three tools to use. Mine, we use Raven Tools. It's a paid product. Um, the reason I like it, Moz I think is great. I think they'll probably mention Moz. Moz is $99 a month for five sites, which is not bad. Raven is $99 a month uh, for unlimited. And what I like about Raven is it doesn't require any access to someone's site. So if we have a client reach out and say, hey, we want to talk to you guys next week about maybe building a site, you know, redoing our site. I can take theirs and put it in, in Raven today, and it can run some analytics and stuff for us without us having access to their site. Um, and then Positionly is another one we're playing with. Um, ClickHost is big on that one, so Carl's encouraged me to try that. And it's more similar to, Ra to Moz, excuse me, um, a whole lot cheaper, not quite as good. And then Manage WP that we use a lot for managing all our WordPress sites just finally rolled in their keyword ranking tool yesterday, I think, which is just for tracking ranking. So it's not a whole lot of SEO stuff, but it's one more way to keep track of that stuff and do some pretty reports and that kind of thing. But what other thoughts here? Yeah. So, well, first of all, I don't think that analytics and Google Search Console, the importance can be understated enough. I still work with big companies and they don't even have those. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Good. Well, if they've got those, those are basics. Um, I would say Google's Keyword Planner. So it's a part of the AdWords tool. I'm in their keyword research tool every day. Um, certainly Moz is really good. Uh, and then Screaming Frog is my best friend. That's a very technical tool. It, 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 um, for technical people out there, it crawls all of your pages. It gives you the title tag, the meta description, the H1, the word count, the canonicals. If there's a 404, what type of content it is, it's magical. It's very um, technical for small business owners, but if you know what to do with it, Screaming Frog is amazing. Price, Price is free. You, you can't beat that. Yeah. Mickey, can you go to my blog post where I just documented all my steps on how I got to the top? Um, probably. Let's see. No, not there. Not that one. That there you one, go. Right there. All right, so after this presentation, if you want, you can follow this right here. I give like all the steps that I use to get to the top. Uh, keep scrolling down. Okay. Uh, those are my results, top five, top ten. Anyways. Very informative post there. So yeah. I think. So you can you can go to that blog post and uh, see what done. Just go to, type in Atlanta Web Design. Look for Mr. Technique in there. Just, a recap of my SEO journey on his site. Yeah. There you go. So yeah, if you go to his site, yeah, MrTechnique.com, use the search box in the upper right. Yeah. Um, you can find it that way. You can even type in web designer right here. So. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So uh, yeah, I think we're out of time. Big hand for our panelists here for helping us out. <laughs>